Before the Russian invasion, Ukraine was home to about 44 million people, roughly the same as Spain. It's one of the largest countries by landmass, not population on the European continent. So it's, it's a big and important place, but it's not the kind of place that would normally be at the center of U.S. politics, except it very much has been. For years, Ukraine has occupied an outsized role in American political discourse. Just look at a guy like Paul Manafort. You might remember him. Back in 2016, he was named chairman of the Trump campaign and chief strategist. He was one of many members of a rotating cast of grifters and yes men who surrounded then candidate Trump. Manafort, though, was a veteran political operative who got his start in the 1970s, working with the likes of self-proclaimed dirty trickster Roger Stone and Lee Atwater, the late Republican hatchet man behind the wildly racist Willie Horton ad of the 1988 presidential campaign. And then Manafort's career took a bit of a turn. He started making a living, a lucrative one, by advising and lobbying on behalf of dictators and strongmen. In the early 2000s, he started working for Russian President Vladimir Putin's puppet candidate to lead Ukraine, a guy named Viktor Yanukovych. Now, Yanukovych had tried to steal the presidential election in Ukraine in October 2004 through stuffed ballot boxes and voter intimidation. And his opponent, the pro-Ukraine guy, was even poisoned apparently by Russian agents. Remember that? His face became disfigured. And all of that, the, the macabre spectacle, the face disfigurement, not, led to a popular uprising in Ukraine known as the Orange Revolution, and it brought Viktor Yanukovych down. It handed the election to the legitimate winner. It was around this time that Yanukovych hired Paul Manafort. Manafort was assisted by a political operative named Konstantin Kalimnik who U.S. investigators say is a Russian intelligence official and was integral to Manafort's dealings in Ukraine and Russia. Manafort then gave the Ukrainian Putin candidate a complete political makeover, dressing him like a more traditional politician, coiffed hair, nice suits. Manafort taught the candidate how to mine empathy when speaking to voters, how to modulate his voice when giving speeches. As journalist Franklin Fork reported in Slate, quote, one Ukrainian columnist cheekily asked his readers to identify the 10 elements of Yanukovych rallies that Manafort had imported from the Republican conventions he'd run. And get what, guess what? Their work paid off. The Putin puppet, Viktor Yanukovych, won the Ukrainian presidency in 2010 in an election that was still tainted by allegations of corruption, but it did look like he really won. And things were going fine for this new Putin-approved president for a few years until 2013. And that's why Yanukovych refused to sign this trade agreement with the European Union, opting instead to align Ukraine closer with, you guessed it, Russia. And this decision, along with the naked corruption of Yanukovych and his cronies, sparked massive protests across the country spanning multiple months. Yanukovych was eventually forced out of office as a result, eventually fleeing in the middle of the night to Russia in early 2014. Putin was not happy. He had lost his puppet president, and there were huge pro-democracy protests next door. This was a seismic moment for the Russian president, and you can see that in three brazen geopolitical moves that he made afterwards. The first thing he did was to seize Crimea from Ukraine. Almost immediately after those pro-democracy protests in Ukraine, Putin sent armed soldiers, his little green men, into Crimea, no flags on their uniforms. They occupied government buildings, and Russian forces quickly took control. It was, up until that point, the largest European land grab since World War II. And Putin basically got away with it. There was international condemnation and some sanctions, but nothing close to the outcry we're seeing today. That leads us to the second brazen thing he did. In 2015, Putin deployed official Russian troops outside the former Soviet republics for the first time since the end of the Cold War. He sent troops to intervene in Syria, and they are still there today to keep Bashar al-Assad in power. That intervention was incredibly expensive and brutal, but essentially decisive. Putin managed to secure the victory he wanted, and Assad has stayed in power. That same year, in 2015, Donald Trump announced his run for president. And right before the RNC, where he will accept the party nomination, Trump hires Paul Manafort to come run his campaign for free. Manafort, the guy who got Putin's puppet elected in Ukraine, is now in charge of the Trump campaign. And during Manafort's short tenure, the campaign altered the official Republican platform to tone down its support for military assistance to Ukraine, which in no uncertain terms was a direct gift and signal to Russia. And Trump's own ties to Russian money started coming under scrutiny. 
So to be clear, Mr. Trump has no financial relationships with any Russian oligarchs. That, that's what he said. I, I, that's what I said. That's obviously what the, the, our position is. Convincing. As campaign manager, Paul Manafort also stayed in contact with that alleged Russian operative, Konstantin Kalimnik, who many suspected was just a direct link between the campaign and Russian intelligence. The two men would later go on to cook up this bizarre plot where the eastern Ukrainian territory of Donbass, now the target of Putin's invasion, or the, the place where the war started, because it never really stopped, that the Donbass would break off into its own pro-Russia country, possibly under the rule of disgraced Putin-backed former Ukrainian president, Viktor Yanukovych. Now, Manafort was ultimately ousted from the trench campaign after his obvious corruption and ties to Russia were too much even for them, which brings us back to Putin and his third incredibly brazen act and that is interfering in the 2016 U.S. election in a pretty profound way. It is, of course, impossible to measure the impact of Russia's hack and leak disinformation campaign, but regardless, Putin again got his desired outcome. Donald Trump improbably elected president. So think about it. After the Maidan, after U Ukraine pulls away uh, from Russia, kicking out his stooge, Putin does these three incredibly brazen things all in a row, and they all work out surprisingly well. Seizes Crimea, boosts Assad, helps get Donald Trump elected, all in the span of three years. Now he has an ally in Donald Trump, which is, of course, incredibly important, because Vladimir Putin doesn't really have so-called soft power to pressure foreign policy, aside from natural gas and oil. And while that can be very influential, it's not the same kind of soft power the U.S. and NATO and others can wield in different parts of the world. But Trump becomes Putin's soft power. We see it play out in all kinds of ways, like pushing the leader of Montenegro out of the way at a NATO meeting and repeating the weird Russian line about Montenegro starting World War III by joining NATO. Montenegro is a tiny country with very strong people. Yeah, I'm not against Montenegro uh, right. or Albania. No, by the way, they're very strong people. They're very aggressive people. They make it aggressive. And congratulations, you're in World War III. That was Trump repeating Moscow's position basically verbatim, just like the way Trump would work to delegitimize NATO as a deadbeat alliance taking advantage of the U.S. You know, I went to NATO where we were being ripped off because the other countries, you have 29 countries, and the other countries weren't paying their bills. They were delinquent, you know, in real estate. I noticed people are using that word. I've been using it for the last year. It's like a real estate term. That's when they don't pay their rent. Putin's influence could also be seen in the centrality of Ukraine in Trump's attacks on Hunter Biden, which, of course, undermined the country's legitimacy, highlighted its very real and rampant political corruption, culminating, of course, in Trump's first impeachment for threatening to withhold military aid from Ukrainian President Zelensky unless he helped dig up dirt on the Bidens. In simpler terms, Trump helped legitimize Putin, elevate his status on the world stage, undermine NATO. So when Republican politicians say that Putin would not have invaded Ukraine under Trump, they are probably right, but for the wrong reasons. Putin likely would not have invaded because he did not need to, because Trump was his ultimate gift, doing everything Putin himself wanted to do, elevating Russia, denigrating NATO, delegitimizing Ukraine. Without him in the White House, Putin took matters into his own hands. Invading Ukraine putting the country once again at the center of U.S. politics. As you see, all the players draped in the flag of Ukraine. Only 22 years old, former Dinamo Kiev player, the Everton captain tonight, Vitaly Mikolenko. Soccer to hockey to basketball, all around the world, athletes and fans are rallying around Ukraine as the international sports world imposes their own sanctions against the invasion. The International Paralympic Committee banned Russian and Belarusian athletes from participating in those games, which started today. On Monday, FIFA and the Champions League suspended all Russian international and club soccer teams. Formula One racing canceled competitions held in Russia or Belarus and banned both countries' flags and anthems. The International Tennis Federation suspended both countries from membership or participation. Even EA Sports announced that in solidarity with the Ukrainian people, it would remove the Russian national team and Russian clubs from the FIFA 2022 video game. NBA legend, former Los Angeles Laker Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, says he's glad to see the sports world stepping up, writing earlier this week that by banning all Russian teams from competing in any international sports, 
We are affirming that Russia's exceptions are on actions are unacceptable, that anyone representing their country, even though the athletes may be innocent pawns, will not be welcome. And Kareen Abdul-Jabbar joins me now. Um, I really liked what you had to what, what you had to write and about the power here. It's, it's, it's remarkable to see these scenes across the world where you realize that sports is so much of how these issues might come into people's lives or how they might think of them first and foremost because sports fans are so enthusiastic. What do you see as the role of sports bodies uh, first and foremost in this conflict? Well, it's nice to be with you, uh, Chris. Um, I, I think the uh, people around the world that are sports enthusiasts can uh, add to the pressure that everybody's trying to apply to uh, the, the Russian hor the horrible actions of the uh, Russian state. And, uh, you know, sports is usually uh, something that uh, teaches you about fair play, teamwork, and it extends the... Uh, the limits of human uh, human performance in uh, you know these world records that are set during uh, many of these games. So uh, you know we we have to uh, rein that in because uh, these totalitarian countries are just using it as as propaganda and for their way of life. And we see what their way of life has uh, ended up with. It's, it's horrible what we're seeing on, uh, going on in Russia. Do you, do you think there's a distinction between um, athletes, like Russian athletes who may be competing, uh, and, and official, say, Russian national teams and things like FIFA are holding events in Russia? Because I think there's an argument made that, you know, Russian athletes can't control what their government does. We saw that one Russian tennis player very bravely write no to war on the, on the camera lens. How, how do you think about that distinction between those two? Well, I, I think uh, the ordinary Russian citizen which includes athletes, uh, they have something to say in this. Uh, of course, the people in charge aren't listening to them, but uh, they have something to say. Uh, the world is seeing that uh, they, too, uh, condemn uh, what's going on. So that encourages the people in uh, Ukraine, and hopefully it, uh, it will help them uh, uh, make the points that they need to make uh, against the, the Russian government. The other argument on the, on the other side, right, is that, and you see this with the Olympics, right, this always gets very fraught in the Olympics because all kinds of countries participate in the, the Olympics with all kinds of countries with different regimes doing all kinds of things, right? And there's this idea that actually, you know, contrary to what you're arguing, it should be the opposite, that sports, particularly things like the Olympics or the Paralympics, should be uh, distinguished from the politics of these regimes, that it's a place for people to come together across lines of difference. What do you, what do you think of that argument? Well, I, I think uh, athletes have something to say, and uh, when they get together and uh, promote uh, something, whatever it is, like in 1984, uh, the United mm -hmm. States did not go to the Olympics, and we felt we had good reasons to do that. So uh, it, I think it all depends. People weren't getting murdered and killed in the streets by, uh, uh, you know, a, a modern uh, armed forces uh, that that <laughs> and there's a big difference between what what was happening then and what's happening now. Uh, you know what what we're seeing in the streets of uh, the Ukraine cities is is horrific. Do you think um, the the cessation of sports and and the sort of discontinuation of it, knowing that you know I, I mean FIFA for instance is a huge deal, right? The entire world follows the World Cup. Um, that that will have reverberations with a populace that that. Uh, will be being sent some kind of message that may be outside of what they're learning from state media? I think it adds, adds pressure. And uh, all the pressure we can put on uh, Russia to stop this is, uh, is necessary. This is uh, something that must end. So, uh, you know, we, we have to use uh, the feelings and thoughts of all segments of society, and that includes athletes. I want to play something. Uh, Alexander Ovechkin, who's a, a, a very, very, very acclaimed hockey player in the National Hockey League, he's from Russia, has been uh, quite a big outspoken supporter of Vladimir Putin uh, through the years, uh, has been asked about to, to sort of make comments on this. And, you know, I go back and forth on whether it's fair to ask athletes to sort of answer for their country. And I thought this response from him was was interesting and perhaps telling. I'm curious to get your reaction. Take a listen to what he said. I'm Russian, right? Um, 
sometimes like some some something I can control, you know, it's not in my hands. Um, how I said, like, I hope it's gonna end soon and uh, it's gonna be uh, peace in uh, both countries. And uh, you know, um, I don't I don't control this one. What do you think of that? Well, I I think you know Alexander uh, suggested that uh, the NHL deny payment to the Russian uh, hockey players, and uh, we can't punish all you know all Russians for the actions of the uh, government leadership, but you know we can support them in their protests and uh, you know make it possible for them to be uh, visible and uh, heard. Uh, we, we can do that, and I, I think that will have an effect. Yeah, that was Dominic Hasek, actually, who had uh, recommended the NL repeatedly suspending contracts for all Russian players, uh, saying that every athlete represents not only themselves, but also the nation they come from. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, what a pleasure to have you, sir. Thank you very much.